Good evening. It's uh, seven o two in Dhaka, and a lot of people are already uh, connected. So we will get started. Uh, this is S K Ghosh. I would like to welcome all of you to the fifth offering in our seminar series, uh, the general and structural seminar series. We presented three seminars last week. Yesterday, Dr. Rakib told, talked about the Bidimala, the Building Construction Act of 1952, and the Town Improvement Act of 1953. Uh, today, the topic is concrete materials, which means uh, the materials rather than the structural aspects of concrete. So the ingredients of concrete, uh, the batching, mixing, curing, transportation, uh, and uh, properties of concrete and that kind of topic. Uh, to present it for us, uh, we are lucky again to have Dr. Rakib, whom you all know. Uh, he not only is highly knowledgeable, he is very thorough in, in his presentations, which is good for all of us. Uh, next week, we will do two seminars. Uh, I will be the presenter of both. The first one will be earthquakes and their effects on structures. The second will be experience in past earthquakes, lessons learned. Uh, so, uh, prepared to attend those. And with that little introduction, I will hand you over to Dr. Rakib. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Ghosh. Good evening, everyone. Uh, uh, it's uh, nice to talk to you again. Uh, today's topic is uh, concrete materials. Uh, the previous topics were not so technical. Uh, we are gradually uh, going to our technical staff, going to cover the technical staff. So we'll start with concrete materials today. Uh, the main purpose is to orient you to the new building code BNBC 2020. And uh, concrete materials uh, is covered in BNBC 2020 in different chapters in different parts. As you know that part five is related to construction materials. So naturally, part five covers uh, some information regarding concrete materials. So in part five, uh, chapter two, uh, basically part five, chapter two, this is part five. Uh, I think this is wrong. This should be part six, chapter five. Right, part six, chapter five is dedicatedly on concrete materials. So uh, this chapter covers thoroughly uh, uh, concrete, part six, chapter five. And part six, chapter six is related to RCC design. So there is some treatment to concrete and part six, chapter eight is related to detailing. So again, for the purpose of detailing, uh, some properties of concrete uh, are discussed in this chapter. So please pardon me, the second bullet should be part six, chapter five, that's a mistake. Now we'll start with part five, chapter two. Um, as I've already told you that part five is related to construction materials and the chapter two is the main chapter of part five there uh, at the very beginning of the chapter it is written materials used for the construction of buildings shall conform to standard specifications listed in this part of the code so all materials must conform to the standards that are mentioned in this part again but that doesn't mean that this uh, part of the building code restricts us to use anything that is not mentioned in the code. So this is a very common question I hear from many engineers. So this, that's the second point. 
the court is saying the provisions of this part are not intended to prevent the use of any new and alternative materials. Any such material may be approved provided it is shown to be satisfactory for the purpose intended. So our engineers are free to use any new material, any smart material, uh, uh, which is not mentioned in the code, but there has to be some procedure. The engineer must show that this new material its performance is satisfactory. How, how can he show that? So the procedure is like this. Approval in writing shall be obtained by the owner or his agent before any new alternative or equivalent materials are used. The billing official shall base such approval on the principles set forth above. So the procedure is that the owner must apply to the authority that is the billing official or the authorized officer and the authorized official or authorized officer or building official shall approve it how he shall con he shall uh, ask the billing owner to show the test results so he will he will ask for uh, some tests to be conducted on this new material so that is the procedure but this is never, uh, I don't know, uh, I don't know any single case where this procedure has been followed in Bangladesh. But this is in the code. The provisions of this part do not preclude the use of used or reclaimed materials, provided such materials meet the applicable requirements as for new materials for the intended use. So recycled material, the use of recycled material is not restricted by the code. That is very important. Now there, there is a growing trend of using recycled concrete as aggregate. So you can do that. Now I'll go, uh, I'll first discuss about the uh, constituents of concrete, ingredients of concrete. I'll start, uh, I'll start with the aggregates, fine and coarse aggregate. So in the first paragraph, uh, the standards are mentioned as uh, they are mentioned in part five, chapter two. So we have some uh, Bangladesh standard, ASTM uh, for normal weight concrete, for lightweight, uh, normal weight aggregate, lightweight aggregate, um, other types of aggregate like radiation shielding uh, concrete, aggregate for radiation shielding concrete, which is uh, we need this kind of aggregate for nuclear power plant, uh, etc. And both ASTM and you see uh, Indian standard is also mentioned there. So basically, we mostly we follow ASTM C33. We'll discuss on that, uh, but very common criteria that has to be followed uh, this uh, is the second one nominal size nominal maximum size of course aggregate shall not be larger than so this is a textbook information we all know this but still this is specifically mentioned in the code this is actually mentioned even in astm c33 c33 but again it is mentioned in two places in our building code, one in part five, chapter two, and another in part six, chapter five. So that's why I have written it again here. Uh, although this is just a textbook information that nominal maximum size of course aggregate shall not be larger than one fifth of the narrowest dimension between sides of forms, one third the depth of slabs or three-fourths the minimum clear spacing between individual reinforcing bars or wares, bundles of bars or pre-stressing tendons or ducts, etc. Which one every which one is the smallest? So that will dictate the maximum size of the course aggregate. The third bullet, this is unique uh, to our code, PNBC. You cannot find it anywhere else. 
So this is related to Greek aggregate, Greek bats that we use as aggregate, source aggregate. So uh, the code says, force aggregate made from grade A brick. So as you know, we usually call it first class brick. But in the brick chapter, this is uh, masonry chapter. It, the technical term is grade A. So course aggregate made from grade A brick as specified in BDS 208 may be used in different types of slab and non-structural elements except in applications where the ambient environmental con conditions may impair the performance of concrete made of such aggregate. So actually we shouldn't use this aggregate in <clears throat> coastal areas, marine environment where there is, uh, as, you, as you know, that brick aggregate is porous and uh, it has more water absorption capacity. So in coastal and uh, marine environment, it induces more corrosion to the reinforcing bar of the concrete. So we should avoid in those places. Now let's talk a little about ASTM C33 uh, for fine aggregates. Um, these conditions are there that the deleterious materials should not uh, exceed these limits, <clears throat> like clay lumps and friable particles should not exceed 3% of the volume. Uh, coal and lignite where surface appearance of concrete is of importance should not exceed 0.5%. All other for all other concrete one percent. So, um, in in very few cases, we actually uh, do the tests to check if the deleterious materials exceed these um, percentages. But in important for important structures, we should. And then the fine aggregate shall have not more than forty five percent passing any sieve and retained on the next consecutive sieve and its fineness modulus shall not be less than 2.3 not more than 3.1 and uh, this is important um when we con when we conduct the sieve analysis with standard size sieves uh, sieves in that case this condition that our uh, the fine aggregate should not be uniformly graded that is all the, uh, most of the aggregate particles are of similar particle size. In that case, we call it uh, uniformly graded, not well graded. So we, it should not be uniformly graded or gap graded, as you know. So that is controlled through this that uh, in any sieve, there shouldn't be more than 45% uh, retained. And finest modulus should not be less than 2.3. This is, in Bangladesh, this is difficult to uh, follow because in uh, which we call Pitabal, uh, that is, we mix silet sand with uh, riverbed sand. And the riverbed sand particle size is very small. In very, it is very difficult to find riverbed sand with the finest modulus two or more. In that case, um, it, does it mean that we cannot use the riverbed material sand uh, um, uh, by mixing with silet sand to make concrete? <clears throat> no, the code allows that, but the code says that you have to make trial mixes and show that uh, you can produce concrete with desired properties, compressive strength and other properties. Uh, you have to first make sure that with mixed design. If, 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 that, uh, if the sand passes those tests, like uh, concrete have, uh, has desired strength, only in that case you can use sand uh, having finest modul modulus less than 2.3. So that is important. So mixed design is important. Now in ASTM C33, there are different 
uh, numbers of this is related to course aggregate. There are different numbers of course aggregate, um, like in in our case, there wide uh, uh, size, uh, wide variations in size. In our case, we usually use this one, like uh, we say 20 milli downgrade. So this is the 20 milli downgrade size. The gradation should follow this. There is a range among the uh, sieve sizes. So the gradation should follow this. Or in some cases, we use half inch downgrade or 12.5 milli downgrade. So the gradation should follow this, but we seldom check this. In most of the cases, uh, we use a uh, crushing machine to break this uh, aggregate, coarse aggregate. It could be brick bats or stones. In that cases, in, uh, in many cases, the aggradation is not appropriate. So we should check the gradation by sieve analysis. So in very <laughs> in brief, that was about the aggregates. Um, of course, you have to check the aggregate um, quality. So you all know about those things. So I'm skipping that. So more important constituent ingredient is cement. So what is there in the code about cement? The code uh, mentions both BDS standard and ASTM standards that uh, we can use cement, which is made following these standards, either BDS or ASTM. Uh, in other words, we can test the cement following uh, EN test uh, specifications or ASTM test, test specifications. So if the cement passes any of them, the court says it's okay. But there's a big problem in Bangladesh, our BDS standard is BDS EN 197.1. That means the manufacturers follow only this standard, BDS EN 197. The manufacturers do not follow ASTM C-150 or ASTM C-595. But uh, in the field or for designing, as we design uh, following BNBC, which actually is from ACI, so we follow the American standards for design. So uh, we want to test the cement following the ASTM standards. So there is a gap. The manufacturers follow EN standard and the and the engineers follow ASTM standard. So what are the differences in these standards? We'll talk about that. So in BDS EN uh, standard, there it talks about five types of cement. Same one, two, three, four, five. But in our country, we uh, these two types of cements are available, SEM1 and SEM2. SEM3 has been used in Rupur power plant, nuclear power plant, but SEM3 is not uh, usually available. And SEM4 and SEM5, uh, I think, have never been used in Bangladesh. So basically SEM1 and SEM2. SEM1, Portland cement, usually you call it ordinary Portland cement, OPC. SEM2 is Portland Composite Cement, we call it PCC. So these two types of cements are mostly available in the market, in different brand names. So uh, how uh, we can classify SEM1 and SEM2? So SEM1 is, as I have uh, just mentioned, is ordinary Portland cement that it has got mostly more than 95% clinker. Now, clinker 
and this is the cement we used to have previously. Uh, uh, as you have studied in your uh, engineering course, how cement is produced from clinker. This is that clinker. We'll talk about it again. But in SEM1, ordinary Portland cement, most of it is uh, clinker with very few other additives. But PCC, Portland uh, composite cement, there might be some, there, there is other types of, there are other types of uh, additives. What are they? They could be any of them. Uh, blast furnace lag, silica fuel, pozzolonas, different types of pozzolonas, fly ashes, different types of fly ashes, barn shale or limestone. In Bangladesh, usually, the cement contains Portland composite cement contains blast furnace slag, ply ash, and limestone. You'll find that in the brand, in the uh, on the bag, it is written same two BMVA cell or same two AMVA cell. <clears throat> Usually VSL. These terms are written <clears throat> now. What do we understand by same two AVSL or BMVSL? <clears throat> same two, all Portland composite cements are same two. Now, by A and B, actually, it means in A type cement, same two A type cement, the proportion of clinker is always more than 80%. In same two B type cement, the proportion of clinker is always less than 80%. So that is the demarcating line. If the clinker percentage is more than 80, but less than 95, it is same to A. If the clinker percentage is less than 80, then it is same to B. So now you understand what is same to A and what is same to B. Then comes these S, D, P, Q, V, et cetera, et cetera. So by S, it means blast furnace slag. What is blast furnace slag? We'll talk about it. But this is uh, one kind of additive that is mixed with cement to produce Portland composite cement. So in case of Bangladesh, these two are quite uh, are mostly available. One is same to AM. By M, it means multiple types of additives are added with same two type of cement. That's why M, M is for multiple types. So same to BM. And in many cases, it is mentioned that same to AM. So but in multiple types, what are the types? In Bangladesh, we usually find VSL. So V is for fly ash. What is fly ash? We'll talk about it. S is for blast furnace slag and L is for limestone. Okay, anything else on this page? No. So now you understand by uh, you, what you find uh, written on the cement bag, same to A, M, V, S, L, same to B and V, S, L. Now you'll understand what that uh, technical term means. So, uh, I have added uh, some few slides. Um, probably the version of slides you have downloaded from the web page uh, doesn't have these slides. Anyway, these are just for, uh, from the BDSEM standard. So you'll find there too. Uh, Portland cement clinker, what is this? Um, the, these uh, in the cement clinker, you, the major compounds are calcium silicates. So tricalcium silicate or dicalcium silicate, these are the major compounds in cement clinker, which is produced by uh, burning different types of oxides uh, with limestone. 
So there is uh, there is a fixed uh, there is a certain procedure and a certain mix of ingredients that will that will produce clinker. So this is cement clinker, granulated blast furnace slag. Now, what is blast furnace? We don't have blast furnace in Bangladesh. Blast furnace is the furnace which is used to produce steel from iron, uh, iron that is extracted from ore, iron ore. We don't have any iron ore in Bangladesh. So in the countries where they have iron ore or they import um, uh, iron, iron extracted from iron ore and to produce steel, they need blast furnace. And while producing steel, the impurities on top of the steel, that is called slag. So blast furnace slag is the slag that is produced while uh, manufacturing steel using blast furnace that is from uh, iron, um, iron ore. Now, blast furnace slag usually have these calcium oxide magnesium oxide silicon dioxide these compounds uh, available there so pozzolanic materials there might be different types of pozzolanic materials now what is pozzolanic materials well, what is the definition of pozzolana uh, pozzolanic materials are very fine uh, grained materials the particle size is very fine few hundred nanometers uh, all is much smaller than micrometer so pozzolanic materials have some uh, cementitious properties that may be hydraulic cementitious that it str gains strength from uh, when it comes into uh, contact with water or uh, it may uh, it uh, the fine grains can participate some re in reaction with calcium hydroxide and uh, make strength developing calcium silicate. So pozzolanic materials are mixed with cement to substitute uh, with clinker to substitute some amount of clinker because clinker is expensive. Pozzolanic materials in many cases very cheap. So to reduce the price at the same time, uh, without compromising the strength, these pozzolanic materials uh, can produce more environment-friendly cement. So natural among the pozzolanic materials, there are um, natural pozzolanas, natural which is naturally available from volcanic origin. Uh, there is some natural calcine pozzolana which requires some uh, thermal treatment uh, for production of pozzolanic material. They are also from volcanic origin. Fly ashes. Uh, we have a lot of controversy in Bangladesh about uh, cements uh, which have fly ashes. Fly ashes, this is uh, allowed by the standards that fly ashes can be used as pozzolanic material, although this is classified separately in uh, BDSEN, in EN, EN standard, uh, but they're allowed. Now, what is a, what are fly ashes? Fly ashes are um, when something is burnt, incinerated, the carbon uh, that gets accumulated in the chimney, when that is like soot, something like soup, when that is collected, that uh, the very fine grained ash, that is called fly ash. Fly ash is obtained by electrostatic or mechanical precipitation of dust-like particles from the flue gases from furnaces fired with pulverized coal. So when any organic material is burnt and pulverized, it produces a fly ash in the chimney on the uh, side of the chimney, surface of the chimney. Uh, now, there are two types of fly ashes, uh, silice, uh, siliceous fly ash and calcareous fly ash. So they have a little bit different properties. Um, uh, 
like uh, and different composition but both are used in cinema there are other different types of uh, additives like burnt shale shale is a kind of rock when it is burnt uh, in very high temperature a pozzolanic material is produced uh, in our uh, children hill tracks the hills they are mostly made of shale so but burnt shale is not used in the cements that are available in bangladesh limestone uh, in uh, in uh, same two type of cement uh, in many cases the cements have limestone where it is written v s l l stands for limestone and another kind of cement is available in bangladesh which is called plc portland uh, limestone lime cement plc uh, that is the lime content is more that is that is actually uh, that is actually this one, same to AL or BL, that is Portland Limestone Cement, PLC. That is also same to, but the main additive is limestone. One company in Bangladesh, they, they produce PLC. So, so in, in case of um, so there are some, uh, they have some specific composition that is calcium carbonate should be uh, at least 75% then in the limestone. Uh, and organic carbon should not exceed these amounts for different types, for LL type and L type. Silica film is produced while um, manufacturing silicon so we don't have silicon industry in our country that's why we don't have, uh, have silica film and this is not very cheap so it is uh, seldom used in cement manufacturing in our country so basically in bangladesh we uh, these additives are there the v siliceous fly ash s which is blast furnace slag and L limestone. So these are the constituents. Now um, BDSEN classifies um, cement in different strength classes, like 32.5, 42.5, and 52.5 in european uh, style instead of point they use comma so 32.5 42.5 these are the strength classes so in bangladesh uh, both these two types of strength classes are available 42.5 and 52.5 and there are uh, these uh, letters l n r what do they mean in most of the cases, you will find this this number 42.5 N. N means normal or ordinary. R, we don't have R. R means rapid. For rapid early strength gain, this is the class 42.5 R. For ordinary, when you don't need early strength gain, then that is ordinary. In some cases, only for SEM3, there is another class denoted by L, which means low early strength gain. So blast furnace, uh, SEM3 is blast furnace cement, Portland blast furnace cement. So in that type of cement, there is this low early strength gain type is available. So you can uh, understand, uh, looking at these, that early strength in two days. Remember, in EN standard, the test is done on the third day, that is after two days and after seven days. But in ASTM standard, the tests are done at after three days and after seven days. So that's why in EN standard, the early strength is mentioned in terms of two-day strength. 
So today in case of N, it must be more than 10 megapascal for 42.5 and for 52.5. And uh, for R parity, it must be more than 20 megapascal. Oh, sorry. In 52.5, it must be more than N. In case of N, it must be more than 20 megapascal. And in case of R, it must be more than 30 megapascal. So the usual varieties we have are 42.5N and 52.5N. So for 42.5N, there is this limit that two days strength must be greater than 10 megapascal and here 20 megapascal. But there is no limit for seven day. There is limit for 28 day strength. For 28 day strength, uh, there is an upper limit and a lower limit for 42.5 strength class. Lower limit is that it must be greater than 42.5 megapascal, but there is the upper limit. It must be less than 62.5 megapascal. In case of 52.5 megapascal class, lowers there is a low limit, but there is no upper limit. And in terms of setting time, there is a lower limit for initial setting time. For 42.5 class uh, strength class, the initial setting time must be more than 60 minutes not 45 minutes that we usually know. In case of uh, 42.5 strength class, it must be more than, must be more than 60 minutes. Usually uh, the cements that are available in Bangladesh, they all comply with this. And for 52.5 strength class, it must be more than 45 minutes. So. Uh, the cements that are available in the market, they easily comply with these conditions. Okay. And there is some uh, limit on uh, soundness. So if you conduct soundness test, so the expansion must be less than 10 minutes. So usually uh, the cements that we have in Bangladesh, they all comply with these conditions. Sometimes you, you get uh, cements which fail to comply with uh, strength condition, really. Now, that was all about BDSEN, but um, uh, in practice, we follow ASTM C150. In, in manufacturing, BDSEN is uh, followed. In design or in Construction STM is followed. So STM C, there are two standards in the STM. One is STM C150, another is STM C595. So what are the differences? STM C150 is uh, on ordinary Portland cement, OPC. It is just termed as Portland cement. And STM C595 is actually related to what you call SEM2, that is Portland Composite Cement. In STM terminology, they don't call it Portland Composite Cement, they call blended hydraulic cement. So the terminology is different, but that is related to, the, you can compare that with SEM2. So, for ordinary, even for ordinary Portland cement, there are many varieties mentioned in STM C 150. Type 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 5 types. And all of them have another type like type 1A, type 2A, type 3A, type 4A, and type 3A. Not type 4A, type 5A, they don't have, but type 1A, type 2A, type 3A, and type 4A. Uh, for 3A. So this A stands for air and training cement. As you know, that air and training, uh, air and train concrete has many advantages, particularly in the cold countries. Uh, it reduces the freezing and thawing effect. As you know, while uh, 
the, the temperature goes uh, down below uh, freezing temperature. The water, but uh, water in inside concrete, the volume of water increases when it, it is frozen, and that creates pressure. And on and while thawing, it the volume is reduced. If it goes repeatedly, freezing and thawing, the, then the concrete disintegrates. That's the effect, freezing and thawing effect. And uh, air entrenched concrete is used to for uh, to reduce that effect. So and air entraining uh, entrainment has many other advantages too. It reduces bleeding. It reduces segregation, and many other self. Uh, sulfate resisting property uh, improves. So, but in Bangladesh, we don't usually use air and training cement. So we'll talk about type one is the cement that uh, that you can compare with the uh, available same one cement that is available in our market. So that is type one. Type two is moderate sulfate resistant cement. Uh, in BD, in EN also, uh, for sulfate resistance cement, there are uh, different classes like SEM1, it is written SR, SEM1, SR, sulfate resistant SEM1, SEM2, SR. But in our market, the, that those types are not available, but the standard uh, has specifications for those types of cement. So in ASTM, the moderate sulfate resistant cement, moderate heat of hydration, this is very important. We often feel that uh, if um, for mass concreting, if the heat of hydration could be reduced, that would be better. We could, if these types of cement are available, then we could use them in those cases, like type two, image, moderate heat of hydration. Heat of hydration is uh, less than the ordinary Portland cement and moderate sulfate resistance. Uh, type 3 is high early strength, that is like uh, 52.5 or uh, right, 52.5. No, R. Um, in BDS EN, the type of cement like 42.5 R, 52.5 R, you can compare those types with type 3. Type 4 is even less heat of hydration, low heat of hydration, and type five is high sulfate resistance cement. So there are different types mentioned in STMC 150, but the type uh, we use in our country, SEM1, you can compare that with type one cement. Now, uh, the Chemical composition of these uh, different types of cements are specified uh, as shown in this table. So for type one, uh, what should be the percentage of maximum percentage of alumina? What should be the maximum percentage of magnesium oxide? Or what should be the maximum percentage of um, other compounds? The, these are mentioned here. And the properties uh, like fineness, expansion, etc. Among the properties, compressive strength is the most important one that is most often tested. You see, um, in ASTM, both three days and seven days strength are specified for different types. For example, in our case, type one is the SEM1, equivalent to SEM1. Uh, in EN, there are two uh, varieties of SEM1, 42.5 class and 52, uh, SEM1 is always, sorry, SEM1 is always 52.5 class. So uh, the uh, 28 day strength of SEM1 must be uh, greater than 52.5 MPA. But in ASTM, 28, 28 day strength is not specified. In ASTM, three day and seven day strengths are specified. For uh, type one, three day strength must be 12, more than 12 MPA, and seven day strength must be 19, greater than 19 MPA. So this is interesting. 
another difference is that the setting time. Setting time, both initial setting time and final setting time are specified in ASTM. But EN, only initial setting time is specified. Final setting time is not specified. In EN for SEM1, that is 52.5 strength class, for, for that, uh, the initial setting, limit of initial setting time is minimum 45 minutes. Here it is same. Uh, in ASTM, the minimum limit of uh, initial setting time is 45 minutes. But the upper limit is very tight. Upper limit is 375 minutes, final setting time. For final setting time, it must be less than, not more than, 375 minutes. This is difficult to, our many uh, cement companies are struggling to uh, maintain this final setting time. We do a lot of tests in Buet. In many cases, we find that even for reputed cement companies, they are having problems in maintaining this final setting time because in the manufacturing process, they are following EN and EN doesn't have any limit on final setting time. So when they test their cement according to EN standard, uh, EN test protocols, they don't, don't find any problem. But when those cements are tested following ASTM, Usually, strength-wise, they don't face any problem, but this is the problem. Final setting time, in many cases, the final setting time exceeds this value, 375 minutes. And STMC 595 uh, is uh, related to blended hydraulic cement, which you can compare with SEM2, according to the EN standard. And in blended hydraulic cement, they have different types. In EN standard, same, you have same to A, same to B, and same to many, depending on the additive, uh, same to AS, same to BS, same to AL, same to BL, same to AM, same to BM, etc. Here they are classifying in ASTM five classes. Type IS is Portland Blast Furnace Slack Cement, uh, where the slack constituent is between 25 and 70%. By slag, ASTM always refer to blast furnace slag, not any other type of slag, blast furnace slag. So uh, should be between 25 and 70%, very wide range. So when slag is mixed with uh, clinker and uh, cement is produced, that is called Portland Blast Furnace Slag Cement. Portland Pozzolan Cement, when other types of pozzolanic materials are uh, used, uh, then it is called Portland Pozzolan Cement. The percentage of pozzolan can be from 15 to 40 percent. Again, a wide, wide uh, range. Portland Pozzolan cement for use when higher strengths at early ages are not required. That is uh, like N. You can compare the cements that are available in Bangladesh, same two, 42.5N or 52.5N. Same two, most of the time is 42.5N. Uh, th that you can compare with this type P, Portland Pozzolan cement for use when higher strengths at early ages are not required. Uh, type I, PN, Portland modified Portland cement. That is basically this is Portland cement. There is a little addition of uh, pozzolanic uh, materials. Uh, it is less than 15%. So this is kind of like type A type, uh, according to EN standard. Uh, same to A, this is like A type because in same to A, uh, clinker percentage is always more than 80%. And in type B, clinker percentage is 
less than 80 percent so this, this is somewhat similar to type a you cannot exactly compare because uh, the standards are different but you can say that they are kind of equivalent type i slag modified portland cement that is basically portland cement certain percentage of slag is mixed less than 25 percent slag is mixed so slag modified portland cement type a slag cement for use in combination with portland cement in making concrete so this is like a sem3 well, very large portion of uh, slag is used in this type of cement is mostly slag a little bit of clinker so this is like um, same three blast furnace cement of en so these are the different types of uh, had blended hydraulic cements that are specified now blast furnace slag definition of blast furnace slag as mentioned is as, uh, in stm c5195 blast furnace slag shall be the non-metallic product consistently consisting essentially of silicates and aluminum silicates of calcium and other bases that is developed in a molten condition simultaneously with iron in a blast furnace. So while producing steel in a blast furnace from iron that is extracted from iron ore uh, in blast furnace, the impurity on top of the steel, the melted molten impurity of other uh, metals that is blast furnace slag. Pozolan, pozolan shall be a siliceous or siliceous and aluminous material, which in itself possesses little or no cementitious value, but which will, in finely divided form and in the presence of moisture, chemically react with calcium hydroxide at ordinary temperatures to form compounds possessing cementitious properties. So. It doesn't naturally have the cementitious properties, but in certain conditions when there is moisture, it reacts with calcium hydroxide. This is called pozzolanic property. The, the hydraulic property, when some compound gains strength just by coming in contact with moisture, that is hydraulic property. And pozzolanic property um, engages in chemical reaction with calcium hydroxide and then it uh, creates some compound which has strength. That is pozzolanic property. So ASTM C 595, then, so we can compare now the standards, like uh, in BDS EN, SEM 1, we have to co compare with ASTM C 150 type 1, and for SEM 2, we have to compare with uh, ASTM C595 type I, S, or P. So, if I if we compare the properties as mentioned, it's ASTM C595 and uh, BDS EN same two type cement, then we see that here again uh, for setting time, ASTM is providing limits for both for initial setting time and final set, final setting time the initial setting time is 45 minutes a little bit more strict than uh en in en standard for 42.5 strength class the um, initial setting time must be oh sorry this one is more liberal, EN is more uh, strict. Um, the initial setting time for 42.5 uh, strength class is 60 minutes. So initial setting time must be more than 60 minutes in case of EN. But in case of ASTM, if it is more than 45 minutes, then it's okay. The problem with the, the final setting time. Final setting time must be less than seven hours, which is 420 minutes. Uh, but in EN standard, there is no limit for final setting time. So uh, even for same two type of uh, cement, uh, many companies struggle to uh, achieve this property for their cement. 
And compressive strength, here you see that for ordinary Portland cement, 28 day strength is not specified. But for hydraulic blended cement, like SEM2 cement, even in the STM standard, 28 day strength is specified. Okay. And uh, 28 day strength, 3 day strength, and 7 day strength. They are all specified in case of ASTM C595. So these are all about Siemens, uh, two different standards, BDS EM and ASTM. Now let's talk about other uh, ingredients, water, very simple, water and in our textbooks, we always learn that water must be portable, that is drinkable. Only portable water can be used in concreting. But the quote says, here also, water used in mixing concrete shall be clean and free from injurious amounts of oils, alkali, alkali, alkaline salts, organic materials or other substances that may be deleterious to concrete or reinforcement. Absolutely okay. Then it says non-portable water shall not be used in concrete unless the following are satisfied. So, so usually we will we'll not use non-portable water. We will always use portable water. But non-portable water in certain cases we can use. Like selection of concrete proportions shall be based on concrete mixes using water from such source. So in mixed design, we have to use that water and see and test uh, if the uh, properties of concrete are okay or not. Mortar test cubes made with non-portable mixing water shall have seven day and 28 day strengths equal to at least 90% of strength as uh, specified, similar specimens made with portable water. So if our water quality is such that that is non-potable, but uh, if we use that water in making con uh, cement cubes, mortar cubes, with potable, we can uh, make mortar cubes with potable water and non-potable water and uh, test them. If the 28 day strength of uh, the mortar cubes made with non-potable water is not less than 90% of the strength of those cubes made with potable water, then we can use the non-potable water in making concrete. So, uh, understandably, but this one holds, there shouldn't be any alkaline salt or other deleterious material. Okay, and uh, that was about water. Now, this is another very important topic, reinforcement. So, uh, although the title of today's presentation is concrete materials, but we cannot use concrete without reinforcement. So naturally, reinforcement uh, is relevant. So we'll cover some important information regarding reinforcement that is mentioned in the code. So metal reinforcement, actually steel reinforcement, modulus of elasticity, we always take it as 200 uh, gigapascal. So that is uh, universally true, yes. Then the standards, again, the same problem we have with reinforcement. The Bangladesh standard is based on ISO. 6935-2. And, but the code also talks about ASTM A615. So, uh, we'll compare these two standards. And uh, for, uh, for re reverse, having yield strength more than 410 megapascal, that is 60 KSI or 60,000 PSI, the uh, FY should be the stress corresponding to a strain of 0.35%. Okay, so this is what we call 
uh, offset method. Uh, by that method, we have to calculate yield strength in our uh, while conducting tests. The code also talks about welded deformed steel wire fabric. Until recently, that type of um, steel wire fabric was not available in Bangladesh, but recently, uh, some uh, companies uh, produce steel producing companies are. Uh, uh, marketing this type of product, welded deformed steelware fabric. So the code allows that, and there's there there are specifications for this. Okay, uh, we can use this type of steelware fabric in uh, making slabs. So we can buy a kind of prefabricated mesh of steelware and just pour concrete on that. So now let's talk about the standards. So our standard based on ISO, adopted from ISO, BDS ISO 69352, the bar sizes. These are the standard bar sizes according to ISO. 6 milli, 8 milli, 10 milli, 12 milli, 14 milli, 16 milli, 22 milli, 25 milli, 28 milli, 32, 40, 50. Remember, do some uh, dia missing here, like in some cases we used to have 19 milli, 22 milli, those bar dias are missing in ISO standard. In the ASTM standard, you will find 19 milli, 22 milli, etc. So. The bar sizes, according to the ISO, are different from the uh, from those of ASTM. And here, the nominal cross section area is given, and uh, the weight mass per unit length. Okay. Sometimes some fresh engineers they ask that how can we measure the diameter or if in the test report, the diameter a little bit less than the nominal bar dia. Uh, is that a problem? Remember, for deformed uh, bar, we cannot exactly measure the bar diameter because there there is rib. So in some places the bar diameter is more, in some places it is less. It depends how you hold the slide calipers on, uh, on the river. So, actually, you don't measure bar diameter, never. So the, that's why this is called nominal. The most important thing is mass per unit length. So, measure the weight per unit uh, length, usually for one meter. The, this is the weight. And the code is, uh, tolerates this amount of deviation. If the weight is little bit less like uh, for smaller bar dias if it is less than eight percent or more than eight percent of the standard weight then that is okay this tolerance is okay uh, but if it is less so you will always check the weight per unit length if the weight is less than this tolerance then that is a problem otherwise uh, just uh, from the uh, bar diameter, you cannot make any assessment. Usually the diameter is always, uh, if you convert from area, usually the diameter is always a little bit less than the nominal bar diameter. But this weight is important. So always compare the weight. Now, we are all familiar with the stress strain diagram of mild steel. So there is no point in explaining this. Uh, just I, I will introduce with these notations. In the EN standard, the notation for yield stress is REH. The notation for ultimate strength is RM. The notation for uh, stress corresponding to ultimate strength is AGT and the notation for stress 
corresponding to fracture or breaking point is A. So please remember these notations. Uh, I'm, I'm not going to explain stress rate, the stress rate diagram here. We'll need the notations. So here, the most important table of BDSI, so 6935. So here in the market, what you find? I'm sure that you are very, very familiar with these terms, B400 DWR or B500 CWR. So we, according to ISO, uh, reinforcing bar is classified in this fashion. So all of them are B because all of them are bar. <laughs> That's why probably. And then you will find is either uh, we don't find 300 uh, we find 400 or 420 or 500 so what these mean you can understand they correspond to the yield stress so by b 400 we understand the yield stress is 400 megapascal by B420, we understand the yield stress is 420 megapascal. Now you may wonder why they, uh, these two specifications are there. One is 400 and another is 420. They're so close. The main reason is that 420, 400 is, is a little bit less than 60,000 psi. So B400 does not comply with 60 grade steel of ASTM, but 60,000 PSA is like 410 megapascal. That's why we have another class, which is B420. This is equivalent to 60 grade steel of ASTM. So this is 420 megapascal. And we have 400 megapascal and 500 megapascal. Uh, this is very common in Bangladesh. So 500 grade steel, we call it 500 grade steel, which is actually the yield stress is 500 megapascal. If you convert that into PSI, that is 72,500 PSI. So we have B400, B420, B500. Now uh, B300 is like 40 grade. 40 grade is much uh, actually uh, less than 300 megapascal, but you can call it B300 as 40 grade steel. Now you understand what is 400, 500, and uh, these these numbers. But what about this D or C or B or A? We don't usually see A, B. We always see C, either C or D. So these are actually related to this ductility class. So the reinforcing bars, according to ISO, are classified in different ductility classes. Now, what is ductility? We all know what is ductility. That is the, the amount of strain uh, the mild steel can uh, uh, the mild steel can sustain after yielding in the inelastic phase. So uh, we can uh, theoretically we can say that this uh, uh, strain A or strain at fracture divided by strain at yield is ductility. But ISO doesn't define ductility in this way. It is found that this ratio, that is RM divided by RH, that is ultimate strength divided by yield stress. In ASTM terminology, it is called TY ratio, tensile strength divided by yield stress. This TY ratio, or RM divided by REH ratio, it is uh, found that if this ratio is high, then naturally the ductility of the steel is high. So instead of uh, calculating ductility in terms of strain, Ductility is defined in ISO in terms of this ratio, RM, div RM divided by REH or TY ratio. So you see, for ductility class A, this RM divided by REH is 1.02. Uh, 
only 2% more. Ultimate strength is only 2% more than yield stress. Ductility class B, 1.08. Ductility class C, 1.15. And ductility class D is 1.25. And in, in ductility class D, there is a maximum limit of ultimate strength. Ultimate strength cannot be more than 1.3 times the yield stress. So that is another point here. So ductility class is all about this ratio. So how ductile the steel is. So that's why we find in the market two types, B500C, B500D. So B500C corresponds to ductility class C where the e ultimate strength by yield stress ratio is 1.15 1 but less than 1.25 more than 1.15 but less than 1.25 and for ductility class d the ultimate strength by yield stress ratio is more than 1.25 for p 500d or 420d so this letter c d they represent ductility class. Now, now what about W? W represents if the steel is weldable or not. The chemical composition is, metallurgical composition is such that the, the steel, if the steel is weldable, it can be welded with another iron based material, then that is called W. Uh, if it is not, then there is no W in the uh, frog mark. And R stands for ribbed, that is deformed. So that's, uh, now you understand that B500 DWR means uh, a ribber with yield stress of 500 megapascal. With ductility class D, that is, is ultimate strength you can calculate, minimum ultimate strength. If it is D, then you just have to multiply 500 with 1.25. W stands for weldable, and R is deformed. So that's it. But remember, for ductility class D, there is an upper limit of ultimate strength. And the elongations are also specified. The elongation that is strain uh, A is at fracture. The elongation should be this much. And at the ultimate strength, that is maximum force during uh, at the point of maximum force, the elongation must be this much. So these values are specified. So now we understand the VDS ISO standard. What about ASTM? Let's see that standard sizes in ASTM. Standard sizes of uh, river in according to ASTM A615. You see three, four, five, there is a five here. In ISO, there is no five, six, seven, there's a seven here. Oh, sorry, no, <laughs> these are numbers. The millimeters are here, 10, 13, instead of 12 or 14, there is 13. In ISO, there is 12 and 14, here 13. 16, this is common, 19. In ISO, we have 20, in ASTM, 19. In uh, ISO, there is no 22, in ASTM, we have 22 millirebar. 25 is common and so on, 29, 30, 30, these are larger rivers. So there is no 50, in ISO there is 50 millimeter river. So the standard sizes are different uh, between ISO and uh, ASTM. In our uh, market, you will always find ISO standard because the manufacturers, they follow BDS ISO. So here again, Nominal weight is important rather than the bar diameter. And there are tolerances for weight also uh, mentioned in the STM. Now, the, uh, for grade, in uh, ISO, we have seen that the 300 megapascal, 400, 420, 500, etc. In STM, according to A615, this is one standard. There, there is another standard of STM. We'll go, go to that later. But according to STM A615, there are three grades. 40 grade, you see, 280 megapascal, less than 300. 40 grade, 
60 grade, which is 420 megapascal. That's why in ISO we also have one V420. Uh, and grade 75, which is more than 500 megapascal, 520, because 500 corresponds to 72.5 KSI. So th that's the there is difference. So uh, the uh, grade B, uh, 500 grade steel that is that we find in the market that is that doesn't correspond to any grade of STM. So that's it. These are the grades and the minimum uh, ultimate strength, tensile strength, and minimum yield stress yield strength that is called yield strength according to STM. So these are mentioned in the standard. And the elongation for different bar sizes, the elongation, total strain. So the minimum elongation are also mentioned uh, for different rates of steam. Okay. According to BNBC, this is uh, BNBC design strength. Sorry, no, this is according to STM. Design strength of reinforcement represented by the values of FY and FYT, that is yield strength and, uh, and tensile strength, used in design calculations shall not exceed 550 megapascal. So you see the grade we have is 520. If by testing we get, get something more, but in design calculation, we cannot take more than 550 megapascal. According to ASTM A615, I'm again repeating that because there is another ASTM standard we'll see. And for transverse reinforcement in section and transverse reinforcement, FY or FYT may not exceed 420 megapascal only if the ratio of the actual tensile strength to the actual yield strength is not less than 1.2. That is, which uh, according to our ductility class, this is ductility class B is 1.5, ductility class C, right, ductility class C, and the elongation percentage is not less than 16. Okay, these are the some limits we have, we should remember for design calculations. So we have compared uh, for cement BDS EN standard with two ASTM standards, ASTM, uh, ASTM C150 and ASTM C595. And for uh, reinforcing bar, we have compared BDS ISO 6952 to with ASTM A615 standard. Remember, I, I'm, I've been saying this, that there's another standard, but why I'm not introducing that standard? Because in part five, chapter two of BNBC, ASTM, uh, the other standard of ASTM is not mentioned. That's why I'm not introducing that yet. I'll introduce when the, where that is mentioned, that that standard is mentioned. Uh, uh, in seismic design part, detailing part, they are mentioned about that standard. Now let's talk about a, a little bit about admixtures. So air in training admixtures, you can use air in training cement that is not available in our country. Uh, type 1A, type 2A, those air in training cement, or you can use air in training admixtures with ordinary Portland cement to make air and trained concrete, which have, uh, which has many advantages. So for that, there's a uh, specification, ASTM C216. These admixtures are most common in our country. Water reducing admixture, we mostly we use super plasticizer. Retarding admixture, we also use retarders in ready mix concrete, RMC. Uh, retarders are used accelerating admixtures if we need high early strength then we can use uh, accelerating our admixtures uh, water reducing and retarding at the same time uh, the, there are admixtures that can uh, have both the effects water reducing and retarding 
And what is reducing uh, accelerating ad admixtures? If used in concrete, shall conform to uh, this standard, ASTM C494, for these admixtures. So for air in tuning admixture, a separate standard, ASTM C260. For other types of admixtures, ASTM C494. Or, uh, for uh, flowable concrete, there is yet another standard, STMC1017. So let's see what is there in STMC494. There, the admixtures are classified in these eight classes. Type A, water reducing admixtures. Uh, these are very common water reducing uh, agents. By, by water reducing, what we understand that uh, the water demand, that water cement with less water cement ratio, we can produce concrete with higher strength without compromising workability. But these admixtures have a side effect is that it returns the strength gain. So it delays the setting time. Retarding admixtures are those admixtures which we intentionally use to delay the setting time. For example, for ready mix concrete, the concrete is uh, mixed uh, in the batching plant and it is transported to the site. And during transportation, so that it doesn't set, that's why retarding agents are mixed. Accelerating admixtures when due to some weather condition, we want very fast uh, uh, setting time, early setting and fast strength gain, then we can use a, a accelerating admixtures. Water reducing and retarding admixtures, the admixtures that um, uh, have both the effects and water reducing and accelerating admixtures, the opposite type that it accelerates. At the same time, it uh, reduces the water demand. Water reducing high range admixtures. This is the admixture that, that is available in our country. We mostly use this. Is the other name for this is super plasticizer. That it reduces water demand uh, by a large margin. At the same time, we can uh, produce very, uh, not totally flowable, but very, very workable concrete. And type G water reducing, high range, and returning. So all these effects, both returning and super plastic. Uh, this is uh, RMC factory, RMC um, ready mix concrete uh, industry in the RMC industry. They use this type of admixture. And type S specific performance admixture. So uh, for any specific kind of effect if we want for that special type of admixture is that S, it is categorized separately. So that's all about admixtures. I'm not going in detail about these. Please read STMC 494 for the details about the admixtures. Uh, suggested workability. Now in BNBC again. So we come back to BNBC. 2020, the workability. So for different conditions, placing conditions, the suggested workability, different uh, workability is suggested and degree of workability is mentioned for heavily reinforced sections uh, where we, can, we cannot vibrate, we need high workability. So in terms of slum, 75 milli to 125 milli, three inch to five inches slump is recommended for 20 milli aggregate, maximum aggregate size. Uh, with lightly reinforced sections without vibration or heavily reinforced section with vibration, so medium workability is needed. In terms of slump, it is like 25 to 75 millimeter, one inch to three inch slump. But for low workability uh, situation, concrete of lightly reinforced sections with vibration or concrete with thin sections with vibrations where we don't need much workability. In that case, uh, the 
um, recommended workability is not mentioned in terms of slump, you see, is mentioned in terms of VB time. So VB apparatus, uh, that is very common if you use VB apparatus, and by that, the concrete is similar to slump, you, uh, you have a cone or frustrum, a cone, kind of cone, and you release the uh, cone, and then the, con the fresh concrete stands and you vibrate that. After vibration, uh, during vibration, it gradually, the height uh, gets reduced and at one time it becomes horizontal. The time taken for the concrete cone to become horizontal, that is VB time. So for low workability situation, instead of sum, the recommended value is mentioned in terms, in terms of VB time, 20 second, 20 or 20, 10 second VB, like that. So according to the code, these are the recommended values of workability. Then, Requirements for normal weight aggregate concrete exposed to sulfate containing solutions. So when there is um, a chance of sulfate attack, in that case, what are the uh, requirements? So how do we define sulfate exposure, negligible, moderate, severe, very severe? So water soluble sulfate in soil percent by weight. Uh, so in soil, if the what the amount of water soluble sulfate is in this range then we call it severe or in this range then we call it moderate and in water also this is in soil and this is in water in in these uh, situations uh, the cement type that is recommended is mentioned here for uh, when there is sulfate exposure, like moderate, severe, very severe, then we are all the same one that ordinary Portland cement is not recommended other than same one and B type. Uh, that is same 2A type cement is recommended. Okay. So here, this note is important. Pozolan that has been determined by test or service record to improve sulfate resistance when used in concrete containing type 5 cement. Okay, th that is different. Pozolan can have a beneficial effect uh, to reduce sulfate attack. Maximum water cement ratio is also mentioned here. So uh, not more than Point five. So we sh we should be aware of this that we should test the soil uh, if there is any sulfate chance of sulfate attack. That's very important. Then we can choose the correct type of cement. Maximum chloride ion content for corrosion protection. Again. Another test that we don't usually go for, but we should uh, test for these for corrosion protection, maximum water soluble chloride ion in concrete. So in concrete, after making the concrete, we should check the chloride ion or concentration of chloride ion. If we are producing concrete for pre-stressing purposes, it shouldn't exceed 6%. For Reinforced concrete exposed to chloride in service, like marine environment, uh, in that case, it shouldn't exceed 0.15%. Reinforced concrete that will be dry or protected from moisture in service, 1% it may be okay. Other reinforced concrete construction, 0.3%, etc., like this. So we should also check these, these, uh, like especially for marine environment or in industrial environment, there is, uh, if the environment is corrosive. Minimum concrete strength. According to BNBC, the minimum concrete strength is 17 megapascal. 
Okay, but we'll see the, the exceptions for seismic design in, uh, this is not always true. So minimum concrete strength for structural use of reinforced concrete shall be 20 megapascal. However, for buildings up to four story, the minimum concrete strength may be relaxed to 70 megapascal. So uh, if your building is four story or less, then you can go for 17 megapascal. Otherwise you should, the minimum strength must not be less than 20 megapascal. It is always better to go for higher strength concrete. Maximum permissible water cement ratio. So depending on the strength of concrete, the water cement ratio is, the prescribed water cement ratio is mentioned in this table of BNBC. So you can check it. Then let's talk about curing. Concrete other than high early strength shall be maintained above 10 degrees centigrade and in a moist condition for at least the first seven days after placement, except when cured in accordance. So uh, in usually in practice, what we do, we don't uh, remove the props before 14 days. So uh, if we are sure about the early strength gain, then we can remove it earlier. But usually that is a practice, but according to the code, we must, uh, we must cure the concrete at least for the first seven days, and we should maintain the environment uh, uh, so that it is, uh, the temperature is more than 10 degrees centigrade. For hardly, if a high early strength, uh, strength concrete, uh, high early strength concrete shall be maintained above 10 degrees centigrade in a moist condition for at least the first three days. So for high early strength concrete, if we choose our cement, uh, early strength gain cement, and if we use some admixture like accelerating uh, admixture, in that case, we will produce higher early strength concrete. And for that, in that case, we can cure uh, only for three days at least. So that's important thing about curing that is mentioned in the code. This I have, man this I mentioned in my talk, uh, which was, the third, third session of this training program. Uh, there I mentioned that, what should be the frequency of testing of concrete? In sets should we test uh, during construction? The number one criterion is that one Sunday. So you are, uh, Casting, suppose you, uh, in the first day you cast some concrete, in the second day you cast again uh, some por portion of the structure, but every day you have to take at least one set of cylinders. In the same day, even the if the volume of concrete is more than 60 meter cube, then you have to take more sets. If it is say 100 meter cube, you have to take two sets. If it is say 150 meter cube, then you have to take three sets and so on. It also depends on the surface area. So not only volume, if the, you, you were uh, probably casting less volume con of concrete, but if the area is wide, if it is more than 250 meter square, if it is like 1000 meter square, you have to take four sets of cylinders, okay. Suppose you were uh, constructing a very small building. In that case, suppose you don't need to take three sets, you need to take two sets, but you cannot do that. In a project, you have to take at least three sets of cylinders. In Bangladesh, you'll find many small projects there, they don't take cylinders at all. But according to the code, you must take at least 
three sets of cylinders. If total volume is that is less than 20 meter cube, no test is required. But the exception is if the project is so small that the total volume of concrete is less than 20 meter cube, then you don't need to uh, take cylinders for testing. Okay. So if it is more than 20 meter cube, then at least three sets in a project. And these conditions also uh, apply. One now uh, by one set, what what do you understand by one set? By one set, you can make sets in two different ways. You can take cylinders of the size of 150 millimeter by 300 millimeter, that is six inches by 12 inches, six inches diameter and 12 inches height. In that case, two cylinders will make one set. But if you prepare cylinders of this size, that is 100 millimeter by 200 millimeter, four inch diameter by eight inch height, then you need three cylinders to make one set. So that is the standard. Uh, uh, presently, in most of the cases, we uh, prepare this one 100 millimeter by 200 millimeters. Let's go. Now, after testing from the results, how we do we interpret the results? If for one uh, set, if the test result is less than the design strength, does it mean that we must demolish that casting? No. Uh, the acceptance criteria will depend on the if the cylinders are cured in the laboratory or in the field. If it is in the if it is cured in the laboratory, usually we cure test samples in a tub. The test samples are submerged under water. So if the the under laboratory condition they are cured then average of three sets must be greater than FC prime. That is, a single set may have an average value, which may be less than 75%, but the average of three sets must be more than FC prime. But average of a single set may be less than FC prime, but not less than this value. That is FC prime minus 3.5 megapascal. Okay, uh, 500 uh, PSI. If in, in terms of PSI, FC prime minus 500 PSI or FC prime minus 3.5 megapascal. Uh, for field cured samples, average of each set uh, must be more than 85% of FC prime. No, this is wrong. Average of three sets. It should be average of three sets. Must be more than 85% of FC prime. And average of each set, again, must be more than FC prime minus 3.5 megapascal or 500 PSI. So this is the acceptance criteria. So suppose if your uh, cylinders fail these criteria, what will happen? In that case, you have to take cores, three cores for each low strength set. For each low strength set, so uh, you are uh, collecting a cylinder specimen from different parts. So, for uh, so, for example, one set is made by three hundred by two hundred millimeter cylinder so you will have to cut three cores to represent the same uh, concrete so for each low strength set you have to cut three cores and test the four core samples and if average of three cores not sets average of three cores one core is one cylinder Average of three cores and the standard size of core according to ASTM is uh, four inch dia, 100 millimeter dia. 
if the uh, core size is less, then this criteria will not apply. Then this criteria is too strict if you uh, use smaller DAC core. So there are a lot of literature in ACI. There are a lot of standards in ACI. You have to study those things. In BNBC, those are not mentioned, but uh, for professional practice, you have to study those ACI standards and literature for lower dial course. This is for four inch dial, 100 millimeter dipole. So for average of three cores must be greater than 85% FC of FC prime. And each core must be greater than 75% of FC prime. That is even the cores, each core should not be more than FC prime. If one core is more than 75% of FC prime, then that is okay. An average of three cores is more than 85% of FC prime, then that is okay. Okay, so that is the standard mentioned in uh, the BNBC. And that is uh, directly from ACI. If adequacy remains in doubt, then load test. Even after that, even your core samples, if the core samples fail, then also before deciding demolition, you can go for load test. You can apply. Uh, there, there is a standard procedure how to conduct load test. You have to apply uh, specified amount of load on the structure and measure deformation and then decide. And there is also acceptance and failure criteria in the load test too. So this is very important. Another, there are many other topics in the um, code related to concrete. Uh, most of those materials, uh, of those information, we is common. Uh, we usually know those information, and those are like more mostly textbook like information. So I didn't, uh, I didn't uh, choose those information for today's presentation. But this one I felt um, important because in practical situation. I found violations of these uh, uh, provisions. These are related to conduits and pipes embedded in concrete. So you have a beam or slab. Under the beam, there you have conduits or pipes. That is, we call it concealed, concealed pipe or concealed uh, uh, pipe for. Uh, electrical uh, wearing purposes or plumbing purposes when pipes are embedded in concrete. So what are the provisions in the code? Conduits and pipes of aluminium shall not be embedded in structural concrete unless effectively coated or covered to prevent aluminium concrete reaction. So we, we know that uh, aggregates may react with aluminium compounds so aluminium uh, pipes made of aluminium are not allowed to be used within concrete. Conduits and pipes with their fittings embedded within a column shall not displace more than 4% of the area of cross section on which strength is calculated or which is required for fire protection. So the uh, pipes, they can displays only 4% of the cross-section. That is very important. It cannot displays more than 4% of cross-section. They shall not be larger in outside dimension than one third the overall thickness of the slab. One is uh, one restriction is in terms of area and another restriction in terms of the dimension size one third of the overall thickness of slab. It cannot exceed that. They have nominal inside diameter, not over 50 millimeters. Whatever be the case, it cannot be more than 50 millimeters and are not space, not less than three diameters on centers. So uh, this clause, this is valid only for the if the pipe is um, used in the compression zone. In that case, this is valid. 
they shall not impair significantly the strength of the construction. So we have to be very careful about this. No liquid gas or vapor except water not exceeding 30 degrees centigrade nor 0 0.3 megapascal pressure inside pressure shall be placed in the pipes until the concrete has attained its desired strength. So before 28 days, uh, you cannot start using those pipes by uh, flowing uh, liquid, anything than, other than water. Concrete cover for pipes, conduits and fittings shall not be less than 40 millimeter, nor for a, a concrete exposed to earth or weather, nor 20 millimeter for concrete not exposed to weather or in contact with ground. So this is related to clear cover. Uh, we usually uh, comply with this. Reinforcement with an area not less than 0 0.002 times the area of concrete section shall be provided normal to piping. So the reinforcement that is perpendicular to piping, the minimum amount of reinforcement should be this. So these are some provisions that in construction we often ignore, neglect. So I thought this is very important to cover. This is uh, in that now we come to the detailing part of uh, the code that is uh, part six, chapter eight. This table is provided in part six, chapter eight for different exposure condition. What should be the maximum water cement ratio? We found that for different strength of concrete, the water cement ratio is prescribed in the code, but Depending on the exposure com condition, there is another limit on water cement ratio here in this table. And minimum cement content is also mentioned here. Minimum amount of cement that has to be used in the concrete. So it depends on the uh, exposure condition, environmental condition. There are five categories, mild, moderate, severe, very severe, and extreme. Exposure condition mild. And so uh not aggressive moderate concrete surface away from severe rain concrete subject to condensation concrete surfaces continuously uh, under water concrete in contact with non aggressive soil this is the moderate condition severe concrete surface is exposed to severe rain so when there is severe uh, if the concrete surface is exposed in Bangladesh, in most of the cases outside, the concrete is always exposed to severe rain. So in Bangladesh, this is the normal condition, severe condition. Very severe concrete surface is exposed to seawater spray or corrosive fumes. So in, in marine environment, coastal structures or industries, in the industries, the condition may be severe. Extreme Concrete surface exposed exposed to abrasive action, as for example, seawater carrying solids or flowing water with pH level uh, acidic, very acidic, or machinery or vehicle. So very aggressive condition, and marine uh, structures, off offshore structures. In those extreme conditions, these conditions will be applied. So minimum FC prime. Uh, so for severe condition, in case of uh, Bangladesh, the, uh, in most of the structure, the outside concrete is always exposed to severe rain. Actually, if we follow this table, we cannot make, although, although in different places it is mentioned that minimum concrete strength is 20 megapascal or 17 megapascal if the structure is four storied or less, but because of the environmental condition, we cannot actually go for 20 megapascal. We need to go for 20 megapascal, 25, uh, uh, C25 uh, class concrete, 25 megapascal concrete. So this is, uh, I think, important. We should be aware of this table and we should always go for higher strength concrete, which is always better for the structure. Mm, it seems uh, initially it seems that the cost is more 
but actually it gives more benefit and ultimately it economizes so that's it and nominal cover for different exposure conditions the clear cover for different uh, strength concrete is mentioned in this table and as i've said the water cement minimum water cement ratio is given here maximum sorry maximum water cement ratio and minimum cement con content is also mentioned in this table so this table is actually very important now concrete in special now special moment friends so now we'll discuss about the seismic design uh, last time i mentioned about a seismic design category that has been introduced in the new bnbc bnbc 2020 depending on the zone seismic zone and depending on soil type and occupancy time uh, we are allowed to construct structures of specific seismic design category for example in dhaka if the soil condition is good then we can go for seismic design category c if the soil condition is not good we have to go for seismic cat design category d in seismic design category d we are not allowed to construct or design intermediate moment frames or ordinary moment frames we must go for special moment frames there are exceptions like with in case of dual system with special wall we can have ordinary frame that is different but usually we have to go for uh, special moment frames when in seismic design and in Chittagong and Silet in most of the cases we have to in Silet always we have to go for seismic design category D in Chittagong if it is not over rock the structure is not over rock then uh, we have to go for seismic design category D. So we have to design special moment frames. In case of special moment frames, the minimum concrete strength is 21 megapascal. Specified compressive strength of lightweight concrete, FC prime, shall not be, uh, shall not exceed 35 megapascal unless demonstrated. Okay. So minimum, uh, in most of the cases, we have to stick to these. 21 megapascal is the minimum concrete strength that we should follow. But as we have seen, if we consider exposure conditions, severe exposure conditions, severe rain, then we should go for 25 megapascal concrete. So this is important. More restrictions for special moment frames and special structure walls. The code has these provisions. Number one, deformed reinforcement resisting earthquake induced flexural and axial force. So, deformed reinforcement resisting earthquake induced flexural or axial force, or both, shall comply with uh, ASTM A706 grade 420. Here, you see, previously we talked about ASTM A615. So this is another new standard, ASTM A706. So here in the detailing uh, chapter, part six, chapter eight, while talking about special moment frames and special structural walls, there this new standard, not new, the, this another ASTM standard is mentioned, ASTM A706. We'll see what is there in this standard. And the grade 420 megapascal, uh, a grade 420 steel can be used. It must comply with this. So for special moment frames and special structural walls, grade 420 of ASTM A615 cannot be used. ASTM A706. Alternatively, but it is again, there it is mentioned, alternatively, only VDS ISO 69352 grades 300, 350, 400, and 420, or now it is in ASTM A615 grades 
275 and 420 reinforcement shall be permitted if if it is ACMA 706 then you can use grade 420 but if you want to use any other grades like these then this condition must be fulfilled what are these conditions we'll see but first we have to understand or notice that there is no mention of grade 500 only up to grade 420 there is no mention of grade 500 so for special moment frames and special structure walls you cannot use grade 500 still according to bnbc 2020 this is very important now you can use ACMA 615 grades 420 or 275 or BDS ISO these standards if the actual each strength based on mill test does not exceed FY by more than 125 megapascal, readers shall not exceed the value etc. etc. So it is it is always bad to have higher yield stress that reduces the ductility that we want for seismic design. So that's why it is restricting the value of FY that we can say that suppose our uh, steel is BDS ISO 420, but I'm getting uh, yield stress, I say uh, very close to 500. So is that uh, okay? So there is an upper limit. If I cannot be if I cannot be more than 125 megapascal, the ratio of the actual tensile strength to the actual yield strength is not less than 1.5. That is ductility class D. We have shown that in BDS also there are four ductility classes. The TY ratio defines those, that those ductility classes. If the TY ratio, that is ultimate strength or tensile strength divided by yield strength is 1.25, that represents ductility class D. So we have to use, say, BDS ISO 695 B 420 D WR that bar. So that is important. Minimum elongation in 200 millimeter shall be at least 14% for bar dia. 10 millimeter to 20 millimeter. So elongation. Uh, in BDS ISO, there are two uh, two limits for elongation. One elongation at fracture and another elongation at uh, the highest force, highest stress. So, but this is different. This is total elongation for 200 millimeter gauge. In BDS ISO, the gauge is different. The, the gauge is 5D. In uh, here, it is following ASTM. In ASTM, the gauge for uh, lower uh, river, the gauge length is 200 millimeters. So on that um, gauge length, the elongation must be at least 14%. At least 12% for bar dia 22 millimeter to 36 millimeter, and at least 10% for bar dia 40 millimeter to 60 millimeters. So these are the elongation limits that we have to ensure if we want to use that river for special moment frame or special structure walls. The value of FYT used to compute the amount of confinement reinforcement shall not exceed 700 megapascal. So these are related to longitudinal bar. That is the bars that will resist the earthquake induced force flexural and axial force so these are longitudinal bars and the tie bars confinement reinforcement or stirrups that can have a higher grade but the still the grade must be less than 700 megapascal so this is very restrictive uh, that is mentioned in bnbc 2020 now i will tell you a different story the story is recent oh so before going to that story let's talk about asm a 70 706 this standard we have talked about ACMA 615 so this standard is different 
here we have grade 60 for 20 megapascal and grade 80 rebar 515 megapascal remember in our design we can never uh, according to bnbc we can never uh, take any design strength more than 550 megapascal so this is that grade grade 80 but for special uh, structural frames and special structural walls special moment frames and structural walls we cannot use a grade higher than this even in this standard stm a706 we cannot use grade 80 according to bnbc 2020 and these are the limits for tensile strength and yield strength uh, and elongation this is important this is the difference between stm a615 and stm a706 the composition metallurgical composition is uh, defined that is the other elements that can be uh, other than iron, the elements, what should be the proportion, what should be the percentage of those elements that is clearly specifically defined. In STM S615, only phosphorus is defined, that phosphorus cannot be more than 6%, and maybe any another one is defined, but uh, these are not defined in the STM S615. But STM S706, the properties, uh, the Meteorological composition is clearly defined. And this is tensile strength shall not be less than 1.25 times the actual yield strength. So it means that if a reverb is according to STM A706, that means it is of ductility class D. So that's why we can, without checking, if uh, uh, steel is produced according to a 706 without any further condition we can use that grade 60 according to bnbc 2020. however now as i told you that i would say and i will tell you a different story the story is this one aca 31819 i told you in the third session of our training program that um, bnbc 2020 was actually written in 2010 and for concrete, it followed ACI 31808, which was published in 2008. There, the conditions in ACI 31808, the conditions for designing special moment frames and special structural walls were quite restrictive. The ACI 31808 didn't allow the use of higher grade steels. The highest grade steel that could be used was 60 grade or 420 megapascal but ACA 31819 tells you the different story starting with ACA 31819 ACA ASTM A70 grades 80 and 100 reinforcement is permitted to resist moments axial and shear forces in spatial structure walls and all components of special structure walls, including coupling beams and wall piers. So for special structure walls, ACI 31819 allows you to use grade 80 and even grade 100, which is produced according to STM A706. ASTM A706 grade 80 reinforcement is also permitted in special moment frames. In special moment frames, grade 100 is not permitted, but grade 80 of STM A706 is permitted for special moment frames. The use of grade 100 reinforcement is not allowed in special moment frames because there is insufficient data to demonstrate, okay, that is not permitted. Uh, ASTM A615 grade 80 and grade 100 are not permitted in special seismic systems. So. That is okay. In our case too, we don't permit grade 80 and grade 100 uh, produced according to STM A615. So, but grade 80 is permitted according to 31819, ACA 31819. And for special structure walls, even grade 100 is permitted. But BNBC 2020 doesn't permit that because BNBC 2020 was written based on a previous version of ACI. 
So there is this anomaly, although there may be very good rivers still in the market of higher grades, which are produced uh, by, according to STMA 706, but we cannot use them for seismic uh, systems, special seismic systems uh, because of BNBC 2020. So hopefully in the next version of BNBC, in the next updating of BNBC 2020, this problem will be resolved. Now, another important condition, this is not directly related to uh, concrete material, but still this is really more related to detailing part of uh, seismic design, but still I want to emphasize, that's why I'm, I'm, I want to mention this. This is related to welding of rivers Re for seismic uh, special moment frames and special structure walls. Reinforcement required by factored load combinations which include earthquake effect shall not be worth it. So the reinforcement that you are providing for wind load, this restriction doesn't come for that. The reinforcement that is needed to carry earthquake load, this restriction is imposed on that reinforcement that you cannot weld the longitudinal rivers. The rivers that are needed for uh, sustaining earthquake load. In addition, welding shall not be permitted on stirrups, ties, inserts, or other similar elements to longitudinal uh, reinforcement required by design. So you cannot tie, you cannot uh, weld your tie with the longitudinal river, or you cannot weld the stirrups with your longitudinal river of your beams. So this is important for seismic design point of view. I think that's all I have. This oh no. <laughs> there is one more thing, short grid. This is newly introduced. This has been newly introduced in BNBC 2020. Although the technology is not new in other countries, these are used quite extensively. But we didn't have this topic in uh, BNBC 2006. So th this was uh, included in BNBC 2020. Short grid. What is short grid? You can see in this uh, GF image. So you shoot the concrete to a wall uh, for tunnels and for, for many purposes, uh, this is quite convenient. Uh, so you can shoot the flowable concrete, completely flowable concrete and uh, make a uh, surface. Short grid shall be defined as mortar or concrete pneumatically projected at high velocity onto a surface. That is a uh, short grid. So the, different specifications and uh, prescriptions for short grid are mentioned in part five uh, chapter two no sorry part six chapter five of bnbc 2020 like the maximum course aggregate size is 20 millimeter that is normal maximum is 16 millimeters okay uh usually uh a test panel is made and uh, that panel is tested in level three to 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 determine the load capacity of short pit walls so this is something new that has been introduced in bnbc 2020. oh one more topic this is from part seven Part seven, probably chapter three, that is storage in uh, part seven is related to construction practices. And there is one chapter, probably chapter three, that is related to uh, how we can store different construction materials. So there, how we can store cement that is mentioned. So uh, this is a quite a long uh, section but I have extracted only uh, some important points. To be stored at the work site in a building or shed which is dry, leak proof and moisture proof. This is uh, common knowledge. So we always do that. Bags to be stacked or on wooden planks, maintaining a minimum clearance of 200 millimeters from the floor. So we 
just don't put the cement bags on the floor. We usually put them on a platform that may be wooden plank or of other material, but the distance from the floor, the clear distance from the floor should be 200 millimeters, eight inches. Maximum height of the stack shall be 15 bags and the width not more than four bags or three meters. So we can stack one bag after another on top of one bag, but the total height must not exceed 15 bags. Uh, uh, but, but there is another restriction. If we want to stack more than eight bags, then they have to arrange length and crosswise. So the if we put one bag in same, not south direction, the other bag on top of it should be in east west direction. So crosswise. Then we can make 15 bags sack, uh, stacked. Otherwise, we, if we put uh, all the bags in the same alignment, then we can have uh, eight bags stack at most. Cement uh, shall be used in the order they are received, storage shall facilitate this requirement. So if you stack in a, such a way uh, that uh, the, the f cement that you receive first is at the bottom and the newly received cement is at the top and you start using from the top and you replace the cement bags at the top, then you will always use the uh, newly received cement and the cement at the bottom will be left for a long time unused. And by that way, there is a chance that that cement will be, uh, due to moisture, uh, that cement may set. So you should always use the cement that you receive first. Hooks shall not be used. So sometimes like rice bags, some people can use hooks to uh, transport cement, handle cement from one place to another, but that is not uh, allowed. Workers handling cement shall put on protective hand and face coverings. So we don't always follow this. This is important. Uh, cement, if you, um, if you touch cement for a long time, that causes, uh, that damages your skin. And if you inhale, fine particles of uh, cement uh, through your mouth or nose, that also damages your lungs. So protective hand and face coverings should be used while handling cement. And the last topic is steel storage. Um, so uh, steel, if, if reinforcement bars and structural steel sections shall be coated with cement wash before stacking. So if you, uh, stack reinforcing bar for a long time, there's a chance that they, they can be corroded. So what you can do, you can uh, put uh, uh, cement grout, lean cement grout on, uh, on the reinforcing bar so that they don't get corroded. Uh, bars of different types and sizes and lengths and structural steel sections shall be stored separately to facilitate uh, issues. So so that you can identify which one is of which type or size. Ends of bars and sections of each type shall be painted with separate designated colors to, for, uh, to, for the ease of identification. So that's all I think I have. So if you have any questions. To, to summarize, today we talked about basically concrete materials and and while talking about concrete materials, we must address reinforcing steel. So you talked about different uh, standards that are mentioned on cement and steel and compared them. That's That was the main purpose of today's talk. Thank you so much. So I have to check the question as a box, right? For there are a number of questions area. submitted. Okay.
Okay. As an increasing demand and availability of high strength reverse like 75 grade or 500 W or even more are likely to be used in structure, but the code is restricting to use them in seismic detail as it increases the maximum probable shear to join. How shall a professional handle this? Shall he or she use high strength levers in column, beam, or in slab for flexure and gravity only? And use the 60 grade or lesser strength reverse in shear and joint detailing? Or he or she shall not use high strength reverse? So for lateral load resistance system, if you design special moment frames, so special structural walls, you cannot use a higher grade for lateral load resistance systems. If you have systems that are not participating, secondary systems that are not participating in uh, resisting lateral load, earthquake load, there you can use a uh, higher grade still. Uh, Dr. Ghosh, are you there? No, it appears Dr. Gosha has dropped off. I see. Dr. Prabhu, you can also join in the question answer session. Um, yes. I mean, no, I, I think what you just said is correct. Although I, I don't really understand um, why one should, in the question, one should use, you know, 60 grade for shear. Uh, because in shear, you can have higher strength than required. Uh, it's the flexure that we are concerned about. That is where. Yes. We... That's right. So for shear enforcement, for shear enforcement, you can go for higher grade still. Uh, then, yeah, third and fourth pages missing in given materials. Uh, sorry for that. I added those um, pages at the very last moment, so I couldn't share them. So hopefully. Uh, I'll share them now, and you can even later, Dr. Prabhupada, they can uh, uh, download them later? Yes, uh, as soon as you shared the updated PowerPoint with us, so you can create a new handout and upload okay. it. And they have to check it later. They may have to check it a couple of times <laughs> uh, okay. to and see when. That will be available, right? For the entire training program, the, uh, the lecture yes. materials yeah. of the previous sessions? Yes. Those will be available, yes. right? Yes, that is exactly right. I see. Sir, which cement is better for foundation work and superstructure construction also, SEM2 or SEM1? So, as it is mentioned in a table in the code that for foundation, if there is a, a risk of sulfate attack, so it is always better to use SEM2, not SEM1. But other, uh, other than that, there is no restriction. You can use either SEM1 or SEM2. But uh, sometimes you may want to have uh, high early strength. In that case, SEM1 may, may be useful because SEM2, uh, uh, strength gaining process of SEM2 is uh, a little bit slow than SEM1. So what is... LL. LL is limestone. Lime, so there are two types of limestone uh, having different uh, composition. There is, a, uh, there is a limit for, I'll check, I'll check and tell you. Uh, and there is a limit for organic carbon total organic carbon to TOC, if the total organic carbon uh, is more than 0.5%, then the, that is, uh, is more than 0.2%, then that is L. And if it is less than 0.2%, then that is LL. So total organic content or uh, carbon content. Uh, based on total organic carbon content, we classify limestone. Uh, as L or LL. 
LL has less carbon content. From the cylinder test report, can we evaluate the design strength? For structure analysis with a back calculation, following equations of table 655 of BNBC 2020, for example, the equation for 2035 megapascal of strength, the required average compressive strength is FC prime plus 8.5 megapascal. So it is not uh, advisable that for back calculation from the, uh, the cylinder test report because um, one thing is that you, you uh, first go for mixed design based on the results of the mixed design you uh, actually based on the uh, design strength requirement you make you you go for mixed design and you follow a specific mix proportion but in the field your strength may be sometimes higher sometimes lower depending on many factors of the field. So sometimes you may get uh, greater strength, but that doesn't mean that at all the places of your concrete, uh, concrete casting, you are having that greater strength. So this is not advisable that during construction time from the cylinder test report, you go back and uh, uh, recalculate, uh, go, go, go for back calculation, that is not advisable. Uh, why 28 days strength we consider not 30 or 35 days? Uh, as you know, by 28 days, concrete achieves uh, more than 90% of its strength. So that's why this is a standard that 28 days strength is considered for as a standard strength. 42.5, what does it mean? 42.5 megapascal, 28 day strength of concrete. What should be done if 28 day strength is more than the upper limit for 42.5 in class? What should be done? So that, that the cement shouldn't be used. So it is the manufacturer's responsibility to, to manufacture cement in such a way that complies with the PDS EM standard. Uh, if you find that the cement available, uh, the brand you are using that is not complying with the standard, you shouldn't use that cement. What is the final setting time of cement? Final setting times of uh, setting time as mentioned in the uh, ASTM standard, therefore, ASTM uh, C uh, for ASTM C150, that is ordinary Portland cement. There is uh, the standard, may, as far as I remember, is 320 minutes, 320 minutes probably. And for ASTM A5, C595, that is for composite cement, the final setting time limit is seven hours, 420 minutes. But having said so, there is no uh, limit of final setting time according to BADS EN. So legally, uh, according to the standard, Bangladesh standard, there is no limit for final setting time. But according to STM, there is, oh sorry, 375 minutes for ordinary Portland cement. For composite cement, it is seven hours, 420 hour, uh, minutes. What is the elaboration of BDS EN 197 1 2010? Numbers in this code actually what meant for? So BDS is Bangladesh standard, EN is European normal, normal means standard. 197, there are many standards in EN. So 197 is one of those standards. And 197, they're, they're like one, two, three different, uh, different uh, standards on different types of cements. 
So one one ninety seven one deals with uh, these same one, same two, same three, same four, same five, and their properties. One ninety seven two three deals with other things. I don't remember what they do deal with. And two thousand ten is the year of publication of this standard, year of adoption of this standard. Why there is an upper strength restriction value in strength class of cement? This is a good question. I don't know the answer. Uh, um, only in BDS EN, EN standard for 52.5 uh, uh, class, strength class, this is, there is an upper strength restriction. Oh, sorry, only in 42.5 class, uh, strength class, there is an upper strength restriction. I don't actually know why is it so. Uh, Dr. Prabhu, can I help me? I, I believe, I, I don't, I'm not sure. I believe it might have something to do with the quality control issues because uh, for higher strength, oh, this is upper strength cement, not concrete. I see. Yes, yeah. cement. Yeah. No. <laughs> Unfortunately, no. I don't know. I mean, again, it, it 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 could still be a quality control issue of the production. I think higher higher strength any material requires a higher degree of quality control. So if the, if if you cannot ensure that that kind of degree, so you may want to. So you know, so one may sell a cement of higher, but. Uh, to make to ensure that it actually meets that strength, uh, and yeah, it is it is just my you know vague uh, impression. Basically. Yeah, that, that may be one reason. But what I found, uh, I conducted a test, cement test, extensively. What I found, the cements that uh, the um, cements that uh, shows this kind of high strength, they have very inconsistent properties like their setting time and other properties, uh, they, they are quite inconsistent. So I think for a consistent property, quality, mm -hmm. this has to be maintained. Yes, absolutely. That's why I've yeah. experienced in doing, uh, in testing cement. From my experience, I can say mm -hmm. that. I don't know the exact we, we, we could have really used Dr. Ghosh's expert, expertise in today's. Yeah, is it <laughs> You would have been really good in this. <laughs> Anyway, so Dr. Ghosh has joined? No. No, unfortunately. I no, see. I, I don't see. think okay, you will have to ask him. <laughs> anyway, we'll, we'll try to get back we'll, to we'll, you. Yeah, yes. Sure. Uh, we'll check back with him. We'll check with him and, and respond. Generally, for normal weight concrete, for non air entrained concrete, how much air should we consider? How much air should we consider? You mean by testing? We are not entraining any air, so we usually don't don't test for air entrainment. So maybe there is information I don't know right now. I have to check. Is there any chance of problem if we mix concrete without fine sand? Without fine sand, only with coarse. Mm -hmm without fine sand you mean uh, only with coarse or uh, for example in in micro concrete we don't need to use we don't need to use sand separately but we don't even use uh, coarse aggregate either so you want to use cement with coarse aggregate without fines. That shouldn't produce very good uh, dense concrete. That will produce very porous concrete. So we should not go for that. Which concrete making process do you prefer? Ready mix or handmade concrete? It depends. It depends on the situation like uh, if you have very quality a uh, very good supervision and quality control handmade concrete may be much better because there are issues with ready mix concrete ready mix concrete is supposed to be very good 
that is since the, that is that is supposed to be produced in a uh, very controlled uh, environment but there have been issues with ready mix concrete so if you have uh, the facility for good quality control and supervision you can go for handmade concrete and that may be better than ready mix concrete but in many cases it is uh, just not possible you um, uh, from the context of volume of concrete needed, if you cannot afford to have a batching plant at your site, then uh, you don't have choice usually. Usually you have to go for, you have to opt for ready mix concrete. But if the project size is much, uh, very big, if you can afford to have your own batching plant on the site, then you can uh, avoid using ready mix or if your project is very small where you don't need very large volume amount of concrete you can go for handmade concrete but you have to ensure the quality and supervision fy shall be the stress corresponding to a strain of 0.35 percent please elaborate this section so this is very simple uh, you plot uh, you plot the stress strain diagram. So for higher grade steel, uh, you uh, may not have the uh, quite distinct yielding. So when you don't get that quite distinct yielding, you don't you cannot determine the yield stress. So how you uh, determine the yield stress from the strain x uh, strain uh, axis x axis. You go to 0 0.30035, that is 0.35%, and draw a vertical line, the point at which it intersects with the uh, stress strain diagram, the stress corresponding to that is FY, according to uh, the BNBC for higher grade steel. From practical perspective, which type of cement is preferable? and available in the market respective to different circumstances usually face considered in Bangladesh. So it depends. It depends on, on which application you are going to use it. There is, a, uh, there is a practice in Bangladesh that only for plastering purposes, same two type, that is PCC, Portland Composite Cement is used. And for concreting of uh, structural members, OPC, ordinary Portland cement is used, but this is not a uh, correct concept. Even for structural purposes, you can use PCC. There is no problem in that. Only thing you have to understand that for PCC, you the mix proportion should be appropriate. So you should first uh, go for mix design and determine the correct appropriate mix ratio. Based on that, if you go, if you use PCC, there is no problem. And you have to understand another thing that the strength gain rate for PCC is lower than OPC. If you need to have uh, early strength, then you should go for OPC, ordinary Portland cement. Is there any specific subtype of cement suitable for frequent submergence on and off? Flood and or saline environment available in Bangladesh. For saline environment, uh, there, there are separate classes of cement for sulfate attack and for uh, sulfate resistance, SR. So if there is any risk of uh, exposure to sulfate compounds, then there is separate uh, type of cement other than that uh, it is all um, uh, like a exposure condition for exposure condition what you have the you have minimum strength like 25 mpa uh, if it the condition is severe minimum strength should be 25 mpa uh, concrete and then clear cover there should be a minimum clear cover and uh, maximum water cement ratio and minimum cement content. These are the guidelines that are given in BNBC. 
But cement type, only for sulfate resistance, there is separate type of cement. Have confusion regarding the cylinder test requirement mentioned in BNBC Article 5.6.5.12. BNBC Article 5.6.2.1 and 5.6.2.2 are these criteria for the cylinder prepared from concrete mix design. And the requirement mentioned in Article 5.12 are for, yes, yes, yes. There are two different articles. One article is related to mix design, how to um, actually um, conduct, uh, how to determine the mix design. The whole procedure of mix design is uh, mentioned in BNBC, that is one article. And the acceptance criteria that I mentioned, those are different articles. Those are related to uh, cylinders obtained from site. So these are different articles. Why 72.5 KSI are prohibited in SDCD? Because in SCI 31808, it was prohibited. And BNBC 2020 was written based on SCI 31808. Uh, at that time, uh, there was no 72.5 uh, KSI river available of ductility class D. Only 500 CWR was available. 500 DWR was made available very recently. So that's why it is prohibited in BNBC 2020. So I think I'll take the last question because we have run, we have run out of time. Would you please give an idea why BDS EN is cho chosen without choosing ASTM? by, I, I think you want to say by BSTI. Uh, BSTI has a set procedure how they select one or how they um, adopt a standard. Uh, their scientific committees and those committees after much research they selected BDS EN, EN standard instead of ASTM. The main reason that EN standard allows any other entity to adopt their standard. That is what I have heard from uh, some members of those scientific committees. That EN standard allow you can just adopt EN standard and you you can uh, you have to just acknowledge that this is EN standard. You can adopt that, but with ASTM you cannot adopt in that way. So that is that was the main reason probably to adopt EN uh, for BDS. So there are many other questions, uh, just like the other sessions, we'll um, review these questions and we'll try to answer your questions in near future. By saying this, uh, I'd like to conclude today's session and thank you again for your participation. Thank you. Dr. Prabhupada, if you want to say something. No, I think uh, yeah. what you just said is uh, good enough. So thank you for attending. See you next week again when we have two webinars on earthquakes. So that will be very exciting, I'm sure. Uh, so thank you. See you later.